there is the recipe, their secret recipe, because like you just said right now, Professor, and how you write in Interstellar, I'm quoting you, for at the highest rung of the cosmic ladder of civilizations, there is no dark, there is no ordinary, there is only fulfillment of a sacred trust, continuance. And what you're saying right now is that pretty much engaging with that alien species would mean, would guarantee at least a pathway towards our continuation. And I think on that sense, Professor, my question is, how do we ensure, again, with what's happening across the world right now, it, it, it does seem like, I'm sorry, but the, the, the world does seem like it's on fire, at least the perception of it, it's, it's unfortunate, but are we worthy of getting to another planet? How, how will Alex, you know, if I'm part of, the, of your roster, says, Alex, you're going to Mars, how will I ensure that my evolutionary code won't hijack, you know, my need or desire to just mess up another planet? How do we ensure that, Professor? Well, we, we don't have a guarantee, but um, we can do our best. And um, frankly, I, you know, I, I'm very troubled by the hate and the tribalism that uh, become more and more prominent in our world. I mean, people say that, you know, this time is so much better than it used to be, the, than society used to be a century ago, two centuries ago. But the, the difference is that we now have the ability to globally uh, destroy ourselves. You know, these abilities did not exist more than a century ago. There were no nuclear weapons. And if those go to the hands of terrorists, it will be very damaging. Uh, and also pandemics. We just saw the one that uh, of COVID-19. And, you know, there is a possibility that it came from gain-of-function experiments. This possibility is played down by governments because they uh, prefer to advocate the idea that it came from nature, but it's not at all obvious. Um, and um, you can imagine a much more damaging uh, future pandemic that could result from experimentation by humans. Uh, and uh, um, and artificial intelligence could potentially be used by bad players in a very damaging way, in particular to enhance hate and tribalism. It's already being used on social media for that purpose. So there are many you know, reasons to be concerned, but I'm an optimist because I believe that uh, sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy and we need to have a vision that is positive. Uh, that will be the recipe for our survival. If we have a positive, so what would be my message? Well, first of all, uh, we see on campuses now um, tribalism, and mm -hmm. that results from the fact that universities are subscribing to a political agenda. Okay, so if a university subscribes to one side of the political map, and it doesn't really matter if it's the left or the right, it doesn't really matter because then. What they do by that is first make the the intellectual atmosphere uncomfortable for half of the nation, you know, that ca uh, be belongs to the other tribe, so to speak, of the political map. Um, and secondly, uh, when um, uh, things happen that uh, put uh, a lot of stress on the university, uh, such as a political event uh, of the type that happened on October 7th, uh, that stress test uh, creates even more tension because now the university sides with one uh, side and then politicians in Washington, D.C. or other members of society would try to, uh, you know, would find the, the position of the university unacceptable and create a lot of tension. So my first advice is for university campuses to attend to what, the so-called Calvin Report from the University of Chicago, which basically said that a university should engage in scholarly work. And the way I phrase it as a scientist is that the, the laws of physics can be discovered equally well by Republicans and Democrats. It really doesn't matter what your political view is because the way that electrons, atoms, you know, molecules, uh, radiation behave has nothing to do with your political beliefs. So, <laughs> so there is a lot of 
scholarly work that can be pursued. And once you mix a political agenda with excellence in research, excellence in scholarly work, when you judge people in academia uh, by uh, evaluating their political standing instead of evaluating their scholarship, it's very dangerous because you are basically creating an instability that would diminish the role of academia in society. And that's, so that's, and now I, I, I want to bring it to the next level, which is to say that academia can help remove the, the hate within society by basically trying to look for ways of uh, engaging in dialogues and, and, and bringing people with different opinions to speak with each other so that we can all identify some common ground and that should be actually the role of academia to bring people together from di with different opinions. And I call that diversity of opinions. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. The FIRE uh, organization um, uh, evaluated that, for example, in, in terms of freedom of speech and uh, academic freedom, Harvard ranks last among colleges, which is really bad. I mean, so people advocate freedom of speech, but only for those who agree with them. And that's uh, that goes against the principle of engaging in dialogues with those who do not agree with you. Uh, and you want to also understand those people from the other side, the, where they come from, and maybe they have a good point, you know. So, so the tolerance of accepting uh, members of other tribes, I think, should originate from campuses rather than the other way around, where right now campuses are on one side of the political spectrum and as a result, they create even more tension, more polarization. So the way I see it is if humanity, if humans, people uh, would give up on that idea of hating members of another tribe. And by the way, it will have the side effect of not hating aliens as well, right? Because... <laughs> We are all members of the tribe of humanity and we should accept those who are different from us. So, you know, it was all summarized. I was at dinner uh, a couple of months ago where the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, her name is Paula Antonelli, summarized it in three words. And that was after General Patreos, who was also in that dinner, you know, made his assessment for the future uh, of the Middle East uh, following the October 7th uh, uh, war. Um, and she said, love the aliens. And the way I understand it is you should love or respect those who are different than you are. So that goes both in terms of healing the wounds within our society, but also from my perspective, it goes also to staying curious and willing to engage with aliens and, and search and put money into the search for neighbors, cosmic neighbors. You know, the evidence will not fall into our lap. You know, Elon Musk keeps saying, I saw him giving a speech just today saying, I haven't seen any evidence. Well, of course, because you are not doing a, a focused research uh, using telescopes to search for those aliens, you know, you really need to invest money in the facilities that would allow you to see them. Just like we invest, uh, you know, billions of dollars in the Large Hadron Collider, smashing particles to find new particles, you know, it's getting new knowledge requires a lot of money, a lot of effort. And so when people say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. So it's actually the Elon Musk who should say, let's put money into looking for aliens because it's a fundamental question that is so important and, and, and so exciting. Instead of him saying, well, I look around, I don't see anything. You know, that is not really the approach that science uh, is adapting in finding new knowledge. Wow, Professor, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And I'm embracing a lot of, of your ideas, you know, 